Hi. Thank you so much to you all for coming. And uh, especially thank you to Sandhya and Ravi for having me and to the wonderful Shada Ugra for agreeing to um, be in conversation with me, bumbling my way through this evening. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about cricket in Sri Lanka, or Salon, as it was many years ago. And um, on the screen you can see Dr. Churchill Hector Gunasekara, who was Sri Lanka's, Sri Lankan cricket's first international star. Um, in many ways, Dr. Gunasekara was the archetypal Singhalese gent. He was a pianist and a dancer. In later life, he owned and bred horses. He wrote plays. He was Colombo's chief medical officer, and he helped introduce to the island crematoriums to cut out the use of costly, uh, environmentally damaging pyres. So, um, as a true gentleman, when he left Royal College in 1912, he boarded a boat to go to university at Cambridge. And um, he tried out for the university team, but there was bigotry and racism. The English were horribly badly behaved, and so he was cut out. But he found games for the Indian Gymkhana Club under the stewardship of the larger-than-life Prince Banerjee. And um, when war broke out, they played games at Lords against student teams or military sides. And one day, watching in the pavilion, was the great Pelham Warner. He was hugely impressed by Gunasekara's fielding, and so he invited him for a trial at Middlesex. And over the course of two seasons, Gunasekara captured the imagination of English crowds. He was a marvelous fielder, and although he was Sri Lankan, he was dubbed the Indian rubber man. One newspaper featured an article of him with elasticated limbs stretching in all directions like a real life Stretch Armstrong. And yeah, he caught the imagination of the English public. He uh, was the first and only Sri Lankan cricketer to be part of a county championship winning side. And he showed men and boys all over England that um, cricket in Salon existed. So if we go back a little further, the game owes its roots to the arrival of the East India Company in 1796. Uh, there had been two colonial orders in Sri Lanka before, the Dutch and the Portuguese. Uh, but as I hear it, the Dutch were only interested in growing fat off the beautiful fruits, and the Portuguese were more concerned with trying to spread Catholicism. So when the English arrived, they brought games and they brought cricket. Uh, the first were the coffee planters. They were cut off from the world. They lived in the wild, in the jungle. Uh, and so to entertain themselves, they carved grounds out of the hillside where they could play cricket. They would travel miles on horseback, sometimes setting off well before dawn, so they could arrive at 9 a.m. for a game, break during the hottest part of the day, and in the evening, get involved in a raucous drinking session and bed down at the coffee store. But these were Sri Lankan cricket's pioneers. Before long, the game spread to Colombo, where a city was fast emerging. And in 1833, the Colombo Cricket Club was founded. By the 1860s, it had spread to the two uh, leading anglicized schools, Royal College and St. Thomas's College. And so here we see the English crowds. I mean, as in all countries, I think cricket in Sri Lanka was held back by a colonial paradox, whereby the English who brought the game and who were tasked with spreading it, who announced themselves as cricket's missionaries, uh, often behaved in the most heinous, arrogant, and superior way, uh, which led to consternation from locals initially. Uh, and at the same time, bats and balls were still foreign objects, which seemed a little bit confusing and concerning. And so here we see uh, two of the Hill Country Club's planters, uh, planter clubs, uh, from Decoya and Maschiella, uh, playing a game of cricket with a tent in the background around the 1860s. So Sri Lankan cricket was helped by incredible moments of serendipity, none more significant than the building of the Suez Canal, which meant that Colombo emerged as the natural point of transit for ships traveling between England and Australia. So the men of the Colombo Cricket Club struck on the idea that when these cricketers stopped, why not invite them for a game of cricket? So from the 1870s right through to 1960, Sri Lanka was blessed with the tradition of whistle-stop cricket. Uh, and these matches were supposedly called the whistle-stops because uh, cricketers on the ships would get off, 
they'd play their cricket and when the ship's captain sounded his whistle, they knew it was time to get on and carry on with their journey. And so uh, the whistle stops brought incredible cricketers to Sri Lanka from Grace to Bradman to Boycott. Uh, and you know, for years Sri Lanka existed on the outside of the ICC. In many ways, it was a small island marooned. But the whistle stops brought incredible moments of cricket and they nourished the Colombo scene. They kept Sri Lankan cricket going and they proved a kind of yardstick for local cricketers who oftentimes these guys who they were playing against, they'd only heard about through newspapers or radio broadcasters and they built them up to be superheroes and then they played them on the field and began to realize that they were closer to themselves in standing. And here we see one of the whistle stop sides passing through and the crowds. These matches brought huge crowds and they were enormous events uh, for, the, for Colombo. I think when Dr. Grace came in 1890, it drew 8,000 people and the governor ordered stands taken down so Ghoulface, which was Sri Lankan cricket's first home, could accommodate the many. And here we have Bill Greswell, one of Sri Lanka's first stars, a man who was brought from Somerset by his father so he could work on a rubber plantation and was one of the pioneers of in-swing bowling. He, well, his bowling brought on the batsmen of Sri Lanka, having to deal with this new, as then unfathomable art, taught them to bat correctly, to play better. And on his famous, most famous day in 1920, he had four or five of England's top orders dismissed in single figures as Ceylon reduced them to 120 for nine and pulled off one of the most incredible, incredible giant humblings. And now we have the incomparable Dr. Derek de Serum, uh, who is just one of Sri Lankan cricket's more uh, unique and amazing figures. He went off to Oxford in the 1930s and scored an incredible 100 against Bradman's Australians. Uh, he came back and presided over the scene like a colossus. Uh, even well into his 50s, he was still turning out for his club, the SSC. Uh, he gave so much back. He would sit atop his roller and um, mow the pitch and uh, pay fees for members who couldn't afford them. He picked the team for years and years, although he showed a marked preference for cricketers who'd gone to Oxford and Cambridge like himself. Uh, but he did a lot of good. He taught at Royal and St. Thomas's right up to the year of his death. He'd drop the boys home in his three-wheeled mini moke. Uh, and yeah, he was um, a really incredible cr figure. Much like his great rival, Mahadevan Satasivam, one of, um, I think, crickets, anywhere in crickets, more colorful figures. This chap with the bat. Uh, so Satha, as he's known uh, to everyone in Sri Lanka, or to a generation of Sri Lankans who lionize him, was the most lyrical batsman and uh, a true playboy cricketer who, uh, when he was on trial at his nadir, the judge said that he was a man who believed that work was the curse of the drinking class. Uh, he would, uh, st well, he credited his footwork to ballroom dancing. He'd stay out all night and catch 40 winks in his car and then change into his whites. Uh, he admitted preferring a gin and tonic at the drinks break. But here was a man who, despite his cavalier nature, truly loved cricket. He would wake up every morning and play his shots for half an hour in the mirror and um, played some of the most remarkable innings on, you know, in the days before covers and rollers existed on devilish drying wickets. He made uh, 97, I think, against the Commonwealth, which convinced Frank Worrell, that he was the uh, greatest batsman in the world. And then when he came to Chennai, to Chepok for a game at South India, he scored the most lyrical double hundred, which was uh, sectioned off by a kind of incredible incident where someone on the first day said to him, I'll offer you a bottle of scotch if you score a hundred. And so he went out and knocked his hundred off, claimed his bottle of scotch and wandered off into the night. And then his roommate was stunned and appalled to hear the door crashing open at six in the morning, Satha stumbling in. Uh, he put him under the shower and got him changed and down to breakfast on time and then he completed his double hundred the next day. Uh, and I think that sums up a little bit about the man. And there he is with the great Garfield Sobers who came to Colombo and um, accompanied him on a 
pub crawl around all of Colombo's cricket clubs, which are many. Uh, so unlike cricket everywhere else, which is based on territories, Sri Lankan cricket's founded on clubs, and so you've got three of Sri Lanka's Sri Lankan cricket's powerhouse clubs all on the same avenue, Maitland Crescent, literally a cricket ball throw away from each other. And so these two staggered around town drinking whiskey and arak and um, regaling each other with their stories. And here we see Sathasivam on trial. His career came to a rather inglorious end when he was falsely accused of murdering his wife. And the police investigation totally collapsed and appeared to be nothing other than fraudulent. Uh, there were clues withheld and uh, the sort of findings of forensic, uh, forensic scientists ignored. Uh, it seemed for some reason or other, the police were determined to pin the crime on Satha. He spent 18 months locked up in jail awaiting trial. Uh, it robbed him of his last good years of cricket. And even when he was declared innocent, it damaged his standing in Sri Lanka and he couldn't escape the rumors so he went to England, um, which was a sad and inglorious end for the greatest batsman who many ever saw and who didn't get the opportunities he deserved and who is not as widely known as he should be. Uh, and I think maybe that's a good time for me to bring up the great Shada Ugra so we can have a little chat about the rest of my book. <laughs> Hi, hi, good evening. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Uh, so happy to see a, a, a full room. Uh, this is a fabulous, fabulous book. It is full of stories. I've got little markings here. If I had kept marking it, it would, there wouldn't be any, you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other. Uh, thanks, Nicholas, for that fantastic uh, photo session. We've got one more picture to go right at the end, uh, which I hope we'll be able to show you, because that's going to, I promise you, blow your mind. Um, so. You know, you, you've seen the pictures when I was talking to Nicholas about this yesterday and I said, listen, what should we talk about? And he said, listen, let's talk about the pre-glory years of Sri Lankan cricket. And he's shown you uh, sort of the historical arc of uh, uh, the fact that um, this was a country that was forgotten. I think, Nicholas, maybe what people would want to know is that what got you to write this book? How many of you have heard his talks before on podcasts or whatever other than okay one is fine so you, you can that's good that's fine that's great yes, yes. my same old stories <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, what uh, brought him to the book and it's quite interesting he was telling you about uh, uh, the little clubs and uh, i was supposed to begin this in a properly lyrical order but of course it's all gone to uh, uh, wherever so um India and Sri Lanka, the, the arc of their cricket was similar up to the point that the East India Company came and you had this first announcement, little history lesson. Uh, in, in 1832, there was an advertisement in the Colombo Journal about a cricket match and uh, the first club set up by the Parsis in India was in 1848. So we're looking around the same time, but the two countries followed a very different arc. Uh, Sri Lankan cricket was completely, uh, began to be focused around these two or three great schools that were there. Sri Lankan school cricket became very important. And now Nicholas can tell his story about what happened when he called the school and why he was doing the book. Uh, so I see, say that Sri Lankan cricket's full of moments of serendipity. And how it started for me was another moment of serendipity because uh, I called St. Thomas's one of the two kind of founding cricket schools in Sri Lanka. And um, so I've been told normally a receptionist answers the phone, but somehow the day that I called, it was picked up by a cricket crazy priest <laughs> called <laughs> Father Roshan Mendes, who uh, is the assistant chaplain of the school and one of the loveliest men I've ever met. And uh, we just got into about a 45 minute long conversation about cricket. And he was telling me all these wonderful things about St. Thomas's and he said, uh, on your tr first trip to Colombo, you must come and see us and watch the first 11 practice. And uh, so I did and it's, uh, in Mount Lavinia, just south of Colombo, they have one of the most beautiful cricket grounds I've ever seen in my life, um, circled by a white picket fence, and on one side, the railroad runs and just separates it from the beach and the Lakadive Sea. Uh, it's gorgeous, and I kind of fell in love as soon as I saw it. And when I thought about moving to Colombo, Father Roshan said, why don't you come and teach at St. Thomas's? And <laughs> I had no idea how I was going to quit my job and start writing a book about Sri Lankan cricket. And so St. Thomas's incredibly kindly said, we can't pay you, but if you come and teach English one day a week, we'll give you your food and board. And so they gave me 
uh, admittedly a slightly crumbling flat, uh, but directly overlooking the cricket ground with these French windows. So I set up my desk right in front of them and watched cricket there pretty much 365 days a year. <laughs> And uh, before before he decided to write the book on uh, Sri Lankan cricket, he was sitting uh, in a basement, uh, Nicholas, and, and writing, uh, working for some super luxury magazine, whatever. Tell them what your job was before. Yeah, this. so I was writing about travel and writing, you know, for brands. I was actually, when it struck me, I was uh, working for a hotel group who had properties all over the world and they wanted me to write about all of them. And I thought, this is amazing. I'll get to travel to them. And they said, no, we just send you brochures. And I was actually... <laughs> Uh, doing it from a windowless basement in London. And um, I don't think, thought this is just about the most depressing job possible. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I decided I wanted to write about cricket and I was incredibly lucky to be put in touch with the uh, great Peter Oborn, who kind of alerted me to the fact that not an awful lot had been written about Sri Lanka. Uh, and so I went to the library at Lords, and I realized it was true. I mean, you know, Indian cricket has shelves and shelves, Australian cricket the same. And then I said, where's your Sri Lanka section? And the librarian kind of pointed me over there and it was just like, you know, half a shelf, mostly taken up by one big book. <laughs> and so, you know, Sri Lanka has this incredible, unique cricket history, but it doesn't have a literary canon to go alongside it. And uh, I wondered why. And I think, um, well, the first thing that I struck on, which I didn't even know, uh, I was a child of the 90s who'd grown up uh, with Jaya Surya, Aravinda, Mahela, thinking that Sri Lankan cricket was on top of the world and that these guys were giants. Uh, and I didn't realize that their actual standing in international circles was totally different and that they were still in many ways regarded uh, quite wrongly as a minnow and that they'd only got test dates in 1981 and that before that there was a hundred years of history which had been incredibly poorly documented and stories which were fast disappearing into the ether. Uh, so I wanted to try and capture some of those before they disappeared forever. So one of the things that will strike you is that, you know, why is there no history of Sri Lankan cricket? Is it not there in Sinhala? Is it not there in any other languages? And as a journalist, the first question I asked Nicholas was, uh, what kind of response did you get? When you went there, you were an unknown how did you set it up? How did people respond to you? How, how did the whole story turn out? How accessible was everybody? Were you a bit worried about being an outsider? Yeah, I was. I mean, uh, especially being like a white man going to Sri Lanka and saying, I'm going to write this history. Uh, I thought that uh, it might be kind of greeted poorly. Uh, but I found it to be the most incredibly welcoming, hospitable place with uh, some of the loveliest, most hospitable people. I mean, in England, if you try and interview anyone, you've got to go through manager and agent and it feels like you're trying to chop their leg off. Uh, but the first trip I went on to Sri Lanka, uh, I think I had an interview my first day with Anura Tenakon, who's one of the great captains from the pre-test era. And straight away he said, who else can I introduce you with? And I was there for probably just under two weeks. I managed to do like 15 interviews uh, and everyone who I spoke to wanted to put me in touch with someone else, wanted to invite me home for tea and quite often samosas and short eats too. Uh, and I fast, I mean, I, I was drawn to this book through a love of cricket, but uh, very soon it, a love of Sri Lanka kind of overtook me as well. And um, yeah, the two things definitely went hand in hand. So the the whole sort of Sri Lankan story, as we know, is running parallel with these whistle stop tours. I'll just read out a list of the number of people who came there. So he said, Grace. Jack Hobbs, Don Bradman. Don Bradman played his first uh, series outside Australia. He played in only two countries uh, and a little bit in the US. He played in Australia. Uh, as far as we know, international cricket in, uh, in Australia and England. But the first match he played outside Australia was in Colombo, in Sri Lanka on a whistle stop tour. So there's Bradman, there's Worrell, there's Jardine. Um, and there is a constant, all the Invincibles uh, are played uh, on that whistle to, uh, stop tour as well, Leary Constantine. So Sri Lanka always had the good and the great of cricket sort of interacting with it, supporting it. Uh, but somehow they never seemed to be able to make that jump until they did that in, uh, in the 80s and so on. The photograph that you saw of Satasimam sitting with his team, uh, it's taken at the P. Sara Oval, uh, which when I was reading the book, um, it's called the Oval, the Oval, the Oval. And I'm thinking, what oval could this be? Because in my mind, the headquarters of Sri Lankan cricket is always the SSC, the Sinhala Sports Club. Uh, that's the only one that's there. 
and then i realized uh, through the book what what uh, nicholas describes is how um, the path of sri lankan cricket suddenly went from being this uh, mixed and and very very uh, um, vibrant diverse sort of culture and uh, people in it into a sort of sinhala nationalism and in the 1970s yes, no uh, 70s early 80s yeah that they moved uh, they built the 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 sri lankan cricket built their new headquarters the actual office in another ground so why didn't you tell them the story of how how the two grounds came to sh uh, sort of symbolize the shift in what sri lankan cricket was about yeah well absolutely i mean peace the pisara oval named after uh, a great man pisara i won't try and say his full name because i'll stumble through it horribly but i mean he you know in the early days sri lankan cricket existed in parks uh, and he wanted a ground that was befitting of the national side so he you know it was an incredible labor of love he had bluegrass imported from australia he had the most beautiful scoreboard erected and Pisara was Sri Lanka's lords uh visiting cricketers also said how much they loved it it had you know totally uncharacteristic of Sri Lankan pitches today but a pitch that was supposedly one of the fastest and bounciest in the world that uh Keith Miller said he wished he could roll up in his pocket and take it everywhere with him and it had some incredible moments of history uh but as Sharda alluded to in the 80s when Sri Lankan cricket was looking for its first proper offices uh one of the patrons of the pisara uh whose name now escapes me uh it'll come back in a second chandra shafter he said we've got office space that um you can use here it's already built it's all set up uh but jr jawardena the prime minister at the time who was uh pursuing horribly divisive policies uh said we don't want anything to do with the tamil union we want to uh move sri lankan cricket away from Tamil identity and so he had offices built at the SSC so that Sri Lankan cricket could be aligned with this uh Sinhalese identity uh which is horribly sad and I think uh it's an incredible sadness that since the 80s we've seen uh Tamil cricketers kind of slowly and slowly dwindling Tamils have been discouraged I guess in kind of every area of Sri Lankan life and while I don't think there's been of uh, discrimination within cricket um it's definitely had an impact and we see less and less tamil cricketers even playing first class cricket in sri lanka which is a huge huge shame and uh, the interesting part about this is that uh, you'll see that uh, before the sri lankan team leaves for any big event there'll always be a picture of the team uh, with some buddhist monks and they all saying a prayer um which has happened uh, as well but somehow uh, regardless of what uh, nicholas has just said there is a sense of the cricketers being able to rise above this kind of ethno nationalism when they play when they players when they when they retire and become somebody else as we know everything changes uh, but when they cricketers it, it tends to be that way everyone knows the story of sangakara saying that his family protected uh, um, uh, about 30 or 50 tamils during the uh, uh, during a period of great violence and then there is the great figure of murli now we will be going back and forth in various things because this how our conversation tends to run um we'll try and tell you fun story so uh, uh, tell us something nicholas tell every, everyone wants to hear about the big stars so uh, we'll talk about the we'll talk about murli and then we'll go back to some of the other uh, fun stories as well murli his tamil identity what it meant uh, what he thinks about it you interviewed him as well yeah well i think it was huge you know um especially in the 90s when uh you know the civil war was kind of probably at its worst and morley said to me himself you know after being called for chucking at the mcg uh the all, most of the selectors didn't want him to go to the world cup because darrell hair basically freed the arm of every other umpire in the world so if any umpire at the world cup was to call morley for chucking sri lanka would be down a man but um arjuna was you know passionately stood behind him and Murli said to me you know Arjuna is a Sinhalese Buddhist and I'm a Hindu Tamil and this is at the height of the civil war just after the central bank bombing which was you know one of the worst incidents to scar colombo but he stood behind me uh, and Arjuna said we're not Sinhalese we're not Tamil we are Sri Lankan and we're cricketers and we stand together and so I think that throughout his career Murli was a hugely powerful symbol as a Sri Lankan hero and uh to me and I think to many he showed sri lanka what 
how much it could achieve if it let go of its divisions and if it focused on unity. And I only hope that in the years to come, we'll see more and more Tamil cricketers breaking through into the national side. And that, um, I mean, Sri Lanka is such a beautiful patchwork society with such diverse influences. And I hope that can be increasingly reflected in its cricket. So this is a sort of a slightly serious note that we've taken on. Uh, in the book, there are just incredible stories about the eccentricity and originality of all these players. And uh, as, as uh, wonderfully Nicholas has spoken about Murli, he also tells the story of how uh, he was enormously irritating as a fellow, as a teammate. He was constantly talking. People didn't want to hang around him. They made him sit in front of the team bus next to the Messiah because no one wanted to sit next to him. Uh, when he was playing county cricket and Andrew Flintoff got out, he came back and Murli said, what? Another shit shot. So that's the kind of conversation that Murli, that's the kind of person that he is. Um, you know, so uh, one of the things that is unique about Sri Lankan cricket, and I think which Nicholas has pointed out beautifully in the entire story, is how they were predecessors and pioneers of so many things. It started with the in-swinger. When I read about that, my eyes just popped uh, about the, the story of Gresswell. And... Um, <laughs> Everyone talks about, oh, Michael Bevan is this great finisher. No, Arjuna was the finisher before Michael Bevan, like number one. Before Ganguly, there was Arjuna, the, the Asian, the pan-Asian captain, the, the South Asian captain who stood up to Aussie bullying was Arjuna. Before Ganguly was five minutes late for toss or whatever, Arjuna stood up to them and was shaking his finger at umpires. And everyone said, no, no, but what about Imran? But in, Imran was almost English, you know, so we will, we will just pretend he wasn't around. But, but uh, um, so Arjuna is this great figure uh, in, in Sri Lankan cricket who comes in there. And um, the other, I mean, there are such moving parts in this book that, that you realize there are like these bits of excellence and these bits of pure goodness in these, in these famous people. Um, that there was a time when they went on tour, Arjuna would pack tins of food. Uh, and to take with him so that cricketer, the, the, the younger players who couldn't afford to go out and eat would at least have tinned food to eat. Uh, he, his family, uh, his home was treated like a hostel and his family would look after the players who were living, who had come for a camp because they were living out of uh, uh, Colombo. It was too far to travel. They all uh, how, were bunked in Arjuna's house. They were fed. Uh, and uh, tell them the story of Jayasurya and why oh. he's second. Yeah, so they all used to sleep in Arjuna's room and uh, Arjuna had to move because apparently Sanath was snoring so much that he said, I'm gone. And he found himself another corner somewhere else of the house. And um, when I was talking to the great Pushpa, uh, Ravi Pushpa Kumara, who is, um, I think he would admit a more peripheral figure in Sri Lankan cricket, but just full of the most amazing stories. He said, who has done this in world cricket? Who's given up their bed so that Sanath can sleep? Uh, so... Yeah, so it's, it's, and my favorite Arjuna story, which I have to tell, I think, which is my most favorite story of the entire book. No, it's not. It can't be because there's so many. Um, let me just find it. So, you know, you've got these players who are saying these absolutely fantastic things to, uh, uh, to Nicholas. Um, see, I knew it. I'd made so many. All right. So, because I've made notes, you have to listen to this. Holland and Denmark protested uh, Sri Lanka's uh, elevation to test cricket. And you're saying, why? Because they said, no, we are better. So you can just jump in and explain uh, yeah, what like happened. The whole till way, I find the story. The whole way through uh, Sri Lankan cricket history, Sri Lanka has just been so disrespected by everyone to the extent that even Holland and Denmark thought they were better than them. <laughs> and um, when they beat Denmark soundly uh, in Denmark, you know, they went, uh, the uh, ICC rep paid for them to go to Denmark so they could prove themselves that they weren't worse than Denmark. Um, but the captain was so pissed off that uh, yeah. they'd been beaten by Sri Lanka that he kind of took his team into the ch changing room and was giving them a dressing down for 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, the Danish board had laid out this incredible feast for the players to eat after uh, the match, you know, with beer and sandwiches, a proper smorgasbord. But the Sri Lankan cricketers, polite to a tea, didn't want to start without the um, Danish cricketers. And so they were waiting and waiting to eat this food. But the Danish cricketers never emerged from the dressing room. So they eventually just had to go and get on the bus and um, all this lovely food remained untouched. <laughs> so I found my, I found my Arjuna story. So this is a, a tour of, uh, um, this is Arjuna versus Okay, it's lost again. This is, oh no, here it is. Yeah, so this is a really, really crappy tour that of, between Pakistan and Sri Lanka. 
and uh, so the Pakistanis are really angry and they're saying, uh, uh, this is, Pakistan was touring Sri Lanka. And at one point, so uh, this is 1986, and how old is Arjuna at the time? He'll be I think in his Arjuna early is still 20s. pretty young. He's like, yeah. uh, he early must 20s. be 20. Yeah, 20. So Madhu should remember that. Yeah. So Madhu here has incredible cricketing <laughs> memory. Yeah, I was Madhu. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so Imran gets really angry and he, uh, he, he comes to Arjuna and he says, I'll knock your head off, warned Imran. So Rana Tunga replies, you've got the ball, I've got the bat, take me on. And this, this guy is 20 years old. So uh, let's talk about Arjuna. Um, he's got a great, the big chunk of the book is called uh, The Age of Arjuna, which is obviously very, very central in Sri Lankan cricket, which helped them come into public notice, even though they had started playing test cricket then. So, so tell us about what kind of figure he is, how complicated things are now at the moment, and then should we show them the photograph? Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, well, I think he is just, Arjuna is totally unique. Uh, I think Sri Lankans in general have a reputation as being quite conflict averse people, but Arjuna is the total opposite. He believes that uh, making an omelette means breaking lots of eggs, and uh, he always has a barb on the tip of his tongue. And uh, he, you know, at the age sort of 18, when I think most Sri Lankans are still living at home under kind of hawkish parental supervision, he was out on the road touring with the team, and uh, Siddharth Wetamuni described him to me as an irritant from the start, that even you know, as a schoolboy, he was just getting under people's skin, sledging people, and uh, taking the fight back. And I think that he really imbued a kind of Sri Lankan identity into Sri Lankan cricket. I think there'd been a uh, tradition and a tendency to sort of ape the MCC, so much so that I heard a story about one boy being sent home from practice because he played the sweep shot. You know, he played it once and the coach said, don't do that again. And he did it again and the key said, right, go home. Uh, and Arjuna changed all of that. And I don't think it's any coincidence that uh, sort of under his tenure, you started to see more individual cricketers coming through. You know, guys morally bowling in a style that no one had ever seen before. Aravinda wandering down the wicket and slapping pace bowlers back over their head. And uh, there was more fight and more steel in Sri Lanka. And um, yeah, I think Arjuna dragged the team up through pure force of will. He stood right behind his cricketers. Uh, they were like a family. Of course, there were lots of fallouts because uh, that's his style. There were failed fitness tests because uh, I don't think he believed that cricketers should run. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, he's, I think he's the most incredible figure. I don't think a captain will ever overtake him in terms of standing in Sri Lanka. And I think the glory in 96 owes a lot to his captaincy, his uh, management of the team. Uh, so there is a great, so if you think we're telling all the stories, we are not. There are tons. I can literally turn the page and tell you a story, which I won't. Uh, so, the, so you're listening to Arjuna. All of you have this picture of Arjuna in your head. All of you Malhar, you have to see Arjuna to believe him. Uh, so the youngest person in this audience is 11. We are so happy he's here. So um, this, I have to read out this section. Do you, do you want to read it? The one about David Fraser? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there. It's at the top. Yeah. Right. On the top there. It's clearly, oh. the, yeah. Fraser strikes on something. Yeah. Oh, no, from, oh. Yeah. Uh, clearly, the Australians felt he was trying to gain an unfair advantage. But for David Fraser, there's something more fundamental at stake. He reckons Arjuna offended the Australians so deeply because he subverted the cult of virility. He's unfit and he's proud of it. This is a fat, effeminate foreigner, walking, yes, walking his singles. He's un he is un-Australian and that is his greatest sin. Fraser strikes on something. Is it possible that the Australians' team's dislike of their opponents stemmed, at least in part, from a disgust over Sri Lanka's brazen unmanliness? More than any other nation in the world, the Islanders flew in the face of Australian ideals of sporting masculinity. Their best batter was five foot four and waddled around the park with one leg shorter than the other. Their star bowler was a double jointed freak who flouted the rules. And their captain looked like the proud owner of an all you can eat restaurant. <laughs> Maybe the Australians were annoyed at being pushed so hard by what they saw as a ragtag bunch of cricketers. <laughs> So I, I found this the most fascinating paragraph because even if you're looking today, you're seeing, uh, you're seeing, uh, you know, we saw lovely Vanindu yesterday. He doesn't look like he wants to win some fitness contest or have some packs or how many ever 
eight packs or he has no packs so uh, it's the it's almost like they are still the counter to the cult of super fit and super sort of the anti cult of kohli kind of a thing that's there if i can yeah, say yeah i think so yeah. and i mean because I you're looking at all their players and you know and even uh, malinga bless him was not this streamlined no, masculine beast so yeah. i mean you know i think malinga is like 5 foot 7 and when he first um came into the side he weighed nothing i think he put on like 30 kilos of muscle so that he could bowl straighter but i mean i think sri lanka i mean sorry i think cricket is a game for all shapes and sizes and that's one of the beautiful things uh about it that it's not played by just sort of you know super fr- super fit muscled kind of robots uh and no i think sri lanka um really epitomizes that and it's got a uh more than anywhere in the world a proud tradition of the cuddly cricketer uh, from i mean it goes back before arjuna if you've ever seen dulip mendes uh he's about as wide as he is tall uh 5 foot 3 and about 6 foot wide and then i mean you know there's so and many a complete beast of a batsman a complete beast you know even though he wasn't what you might think of as you know an ideal sportsman he had presence at the crease and when he stood there there was something fearsome about it and i think bowlers were scared to bowl at him and you know the same with arjuna aravinda sanath uh dilshan herath none of you yeah, forgot it uh, even banuka playing in the ipl now uh, kind of looks like a teddy bear and uh, i think that's uh inspiring for all of us that uh you can do great sporting things without having a 10 pack <laughs> particularly in 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 cricket you know yeah, especially because in cricket because why would you want to be so fantastically fit if you can be so f- if you reasonably can, yeah enjoy your there. rice and curry and still average 50 uh. <laughs> so um the other great thing that we were talking about sort of fans so before we had uh, sudhir and before we had chacha we had uncle percy now i think the sri lankan cricket fan is also something that we have to pay tribute to here because all of us are fans so the, the, the again a fantastic story about percy abisekara is that there was an under 19 match going on between a sri lankan schoolboys and visiting australian schoolboys and if the sri lankan innings uh, uh, if if the australian they had the captain batting and he scored 100 but they really needed to bat on to be able to draw the game otherwise they would be finished so he ran on to the field to sort of cheer and clap and support the captain uh, who scored 100 and the police were really upset and he was arrested and taken away that you can't you can't interrupt the match but percy actually drew that game because that much time was uh, eaten up and when he was being taken away by the police this is a, this is sort of like the literally the perfect arc when he's been taken away by the police uh sata sivan says don't you dare lay a finger on him when he was released by the police there were 1000 people te- cheering up to cheer outside the police station so you've got these stories of these fans then there's another hysterical story uh, but i let him tell uh, the story of this first test match we'll have about 10 minutes more of chatting and then we'll get questions about um drawing the test match at lords it's again it's an incredible story i know we should be talking about scholarship but i feel he has spoken we've talked about scholarship now let's tell the stories <laughs> Um so yeah uh when Sri Lanka first went to Lords in 1984 uh for a test match it was the biggest moment for them and you know Siddhartha Tamuni said to me it's like playing at Wimbledon we were terrified and I think it, for England it wasn't quite the same they just lost 5-0 uh against the West Indies they've been blown out and I think everyone was thinking here's a chance to put a nice little coat of gloss on a horrible summer um and so Uh, England won the toss and put Sri Lanka into bat and Sid Wetamuni the opener said that he was absolutely terrified uh walking through the long room going out for the first time he was like this is just the most horrific experience and then uh some Tamil protesters invaded the pitch and just sat down and he said for a moment he forgot that he was at lords and uh you know the slips were saying to him what's going on here and he was explaining to them what was going on and he said that 5 minute delay just changed everything for me and all the nerves were taken out of him and he went on to score 190 he batted for about 70 hours it remains the longest innings uh, in a test match at lords and uh, he was named one of wisdom's five cricketers of the year and in many ways i think that test match changed uh, sri lanka's international perception and you know people realized the beauty of sri lankan batting because uh, dulip also came incredibly close to scoring twin hundreds he would have scored twin hundreds uh, but 
with Botham bowling off spin at him in the second innings. He tried to hit the ball all the way to South London. And <laughs> it just went straight up in the air. Uh, but he wanted to do it in Dalip style. Uh, I don't think he should have tried to do it any other way. Uh, but yeah, no, that was a game which uh, spurred Sri Lanka on to their first Test match win uh, at home over India the next year. So in this in this story, I was speaking about the fans again. So Botham was just trying to uh, be hostile and bowling short, and he just kept getting attacked. And um, you know, literally, Mendes just kept putting everything into the stands. He just kept hitting everything into the stands, and Botham was withdrawn. And the small group of Sri Lankan fans, there. This is the 1980s. They started cheering, "We want Botham! We want Botham to come and play." So you have to. I mean, they are just uh, their fandom has been incredible over decades. And Uncle Percy is still around. And all of us, when we went to anything, we, we came across anything Sri Lankan. It was, uh, you know, we said Uncle Percy was there. And now I'm being told that uh, someone waves the flag for him because. <laughs> because yeah, I mean, he's far too old now to wave the flag, but he's still going to as many matches as he can, and there's someone there, a lackey, standing next to him <laughs> waving his flag. And uh, he's quite territorial, you know, the junior guys. There's lots of, um, you know, uh, junior fans coming through who want to be the next generation's Uncle Percy, and he's saying, no, these guys aren't the real deal. They're in it for the money. I've been here since 1948. And... Uh, no, he was there in uh, 1984 at Lords. He said his flag got confiscated. And, um, because you can't carry flags to Lords. You can't carry flags at Lords. It's not the done thing in England. Our cricket is very boring. Uh, but um, he said that he was waiting for Wetamuni to uh, get his double hundred and he was going to jump over the barrier and run around the ground. Uh, but he got out at 190. And so Percy said that kept him out of jail for, I don't know, the 15th time, because he's always getting himself into trouble. So, uh, when we're talking about this, uh, uh, you know, this country and its cricketers, and it's seeming like a lot of fun and very lighthearted, but there's a great deal of work and thought that goes into preparing and, and, and making cricketers of this level. Uh, the story of how um, Malinga worked towards becoming the bowler that he did, he had basically uh, two options. His captain would ask him nose or toes. So, that was, the, that was what it was. But he really worked hard. It wasn't just this whole like was said about the West Indies that oh they're natural athletes it's not natural so there's a great quote here from uh, Tony Opata who's a former fast bowler from the West Indies one of the uh, players who went on the rebel tour he said um, I varied my bowling six balls I'd sent six different ways I don't bowl pace all the time I have a change of pace a slower ball an in swinger an out swinger an off cutter a bouncer I got the batsman worrying what's this guy's gonna bowl next I played with batsmen and I enjoyed my cricket very much um it, I don't care if it's Richards or Gavaskar, it's just another guy. If you get scared, you can't bowl. I don't care. I don't respect my opponents when I'm playing. It's a mental sport. If you're scared, you can't perform. Look at Virat Kohli. Everyone's scared of him. Why? Who is he? If I had a ball, I'd shell the bugger. <laughs> so, um, uh, tell us the story. You know, because you're looking at, at this whole story uh, of Sri Lankan cricket outside... Uh, from an outsider's view, where you look at it as exotic and fun and, and kind of all light-hearted. But um, what's the kind of nuances and the shades of their uh, commitment to their craft and uh, that you were able to tap into or, or find out or that surprised you when, you when you spoke to them? And then you tell your favorite story. Because I asked him yesterday, please prepare your favorite story. So he said, yes, yes, yes. So you can tell the favorite story. We have five minutes. Yeah. Um, well, I think there's huge commitment to the craft. I mean, I was overwhelmed by the tradition of schools cricket. You know, um, coming from England where schools cricket's a one-day affair and you get three men and a dog turning up to watch games. Sri Lanka, I mean, they play all at schoolboy two- and three-day cricket. They have this big match tradition where... A school has its rival and they play at the end of the season. And they're huge events which draw like, you know, 15,000 people for a couple of days. Uh, and the schools are really like cricket academies. I mean, at St. Thomas's where I taught, I didn't see any of the first 11 wearing school uniform for the whole year. They're just in their cricket gear um, the whole time practicing, training like pros. And I think there's incredible commitment. Uh, and, you know, we were talking about this yesterday, Shada, that... Uh, it's often seen that like Sri Lankan cricketers are natural, that they don't think. But I think there's huge uh, commitment to the craft. You know, someone like Malinga, who worked incredibly hard and has a great cricket brain, or Mahela, who uh, is just constantly, constantly thinking about cricket. Uh, and I think he's shown it with what he's done with Mumbai Indians as a coach. Uh, no, so I think that it's wrong to kind of... Uh, and even Morley, you know, who is uh, thought of, everyone thinks about the big turn and the double jointedness. But I mean, he was prepared to bowl and bowl. I think in the, at the Oval in 98, 
he bowled more overs than any modern bowler has bowled in a test match. And, you know, he was willing to stick to his areas, to tie batsmen down. And 113 overs. 113 overs. I mean, that's, that's a Herculean workload. Uh, so, you know, it's the big turn that kind of catches the headlines. But it's his, um, you know, dogged work ethic which underpinned it all. Um, and my favorite story, I guess it's of someone who maybe thought a bit less about their cricket, Pushpa, the great Ravi Pushpa Kumara, who um, was invited to Dennis Lilly's MRF Pace Academy, and he didn't realize that pools had a deep end and a shallow end, so he dived in at the shallow end and smashed his head and uh, got sent home. And uh, he was always kind of getting into scrapes, Pushpa, and um, he was 12th man for much of the World Cup. So the night before, when the Australians were very serious, he found out a carpet show, a carpet fair that was going on in the hotel. And he started, um, he went and picked up a carpet. He said, I'm from the Sri Lanka team. Can I get a discount? And the guy said, okay, I'll give it to you half price. And um, some of his teammates admired it. Where'd you get this beautiful carpet? Oh, they're selling them down in the basement. And so the morning of the World Cup final, uh, Arjuna comes down to breakfast and there's no one from the team in the room. And, uh, you know, the Australians are all there in their team gear, sitting in silence, eating their breakfast. And he said, Arjuna was pissed off, right? He said, where the hell are our guys? They're not taking this seriously. They're all, and um, I think Dulip said, oh, they're all buying carpets. And so Arjuna went and was, I think, prepared to give them a stern telling off. And then he looked and thought, oh, these guys are looking laid back. They're enjoying themselves. And so eventually he started buying carpets too. And they were getting discounts and free carpets and all this business. And... Um, so then it came to the game and Sri Lanka were batting and Pushpa Komara was tasked with delivering the instructions. And so coach Dav Watmore comes up to him and says, Pushpa, tell them this. And Dulip says, Pushpa, tell them this. And, you know, everyone is giving Pushpa these messages. And he admitted that at the time his English wasn't the best. And so anything that went into this ear just went straight out the other. Um, and so he ran out to the middle and froze. And he said, well done, boys, keep going. <laughs> and uh, got back to the changing room, and I think Dav said, Pushpa, did you tell them? And he said, yes, yes, Dav. And he said, how could you tell them? You didn't understand. Go and sit down. So just, uh, just one more question before we go to, we go to questions from, from all of you. Um, you know, the, when, when the, uh, you were in Sri Lanka when people uh, write. I wanted to ask this question right at the beginning, so the order is completely gone. So you know how hard India is trying to win a test series in South Africa. We are trying and trying and we are running theories and we are doing this and that and bonding caps. Sri Lanka has gone and won that series without any problem, 2-0, 2-0. So he was there watching the match. I said, is this a very Sri Lankan thing to do? To just turn, it's the only team from Asia that's beaten South Africa in a test series. Not even Pakistan could do it. And never mind, we know our story, so we won't get there. But uh, how did that happen? What is your... You were watching the test match and the city was erupting around you? Yeah, I mean, it was the one time, the kind of moment of light, uh, when I was in Sri Lanka, you know, they were down in the dumps and I'd say to tuk-tuk drivers, so talk to me about cricket, and they say, ah, no, I don't want to talk about that. Uh -huh, and I was wishing I was doing the book 10 years earlier when things were good. But when in Durban when Kusal Pereira, you know, just nine wickets down, started slamming sixes over square leg like, um, like he was playing beach ball or something. Um, you know, the city came to a standstill. And as I hear it, you know, everyone was looking for a TV, crowding around on the street. That was the one moment of joy, but I totally missed it because I was stuck in Colombo, glued in front of my TV in my home bedroom. So uh, I missed all the kind of um, commotion, but I came out and, you know, the whole city was talking about this. And it was one moment which just kind of united everyone. And uh, it's a wonderful thing with Sri Lankan cricket to, that even when it's in the deepest moments of despair, there are these sudden glimmers of light and incredible moments of uh, just joy, like uh, at the 2019 World Cup when I think Sri Lanka picked a squad which no one in the country was happy with and the team was down in the dumps. They somehow beat England, who go on to win the tournament. And I think um, I say in my epilogue, which I wrote at a time when there was less optimism than there is now, uh, no matter how far Sri Lankan cricket falls, there will always be good days uh, because there's too much talent and too much love for cricket and passion for there not to be. Thanks, uh, Nicholas. We'll just take questions now. I, I mean, I have like 10 questions, but I will, I will leave it to the audience. Yeah, 
Yeah, hi. I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you. Have the economic problems uh, created any trouble for Sri Lankan cricket, or are there any chance of streamlining it even better and improving it? Uh, I don't think that economic problems have sort of hit the cricket sphere yet. I think cricket's managed to survive. I think one thing that Shada and I was, were touching on yesterday, you know, during the socioeconomic crisis, uh, which was amazing in a country where political authority isn't very often challenged, to see cricketers like Rosh Mahanama and Mahela Jayawardena out on the street with the people and standing up as symbols was incredibly powerful. And uh, so I think that cricket you know, in Sri Lanka's darkest days has always provided a bit of hope. And I think we saw that with the Australia series last year, you know, which was when there was such terrible crisis that people couldn't even get a tuk-tuk to the game, yet still huge crowds turned up to support and to cheer not just Sri Lanka, but Australia. And so I think cricket is always this kind of beacon of hope for the island. And I th hope that it can always be that. Yeah. Hi, I'm Krishna. Uh, so I've been following Sri Lankan cricket from the mid-70s. And uh, what has struck me is that why are they, apart from being no history books on Sri Lanka, why are the cricket players also not writing their books? Because the only books that I have got are one by Arvinda De Silva. And the entire 80s, 90s, we don't have any book even from Arjuna or Ranatunga or Murli or anyone. So uh, why is that happening? And second is, uh, are there any plans from your side to come up with you know, some books, to collaborate with some Sri Lankan players and come up with some autobiography? Uh, so that's my question. Um, I, I really don't know why there aren't books from these colossal figures. You know, guys like Arjuna, Murali, even Sangar and Mahela uh, should have biographies written about them. You know, in England, I think Johnny Besto is coming up for his third autobiography. And he, you know, he's still playing. Moeen Ali's had about four books. And uh, the only thing that I can think of is that Sri Lanka has traditionally had a kind of culture of more oral storytelling than of literature. And maybe there isn't the same kind of readership market. But I think it's a huge shame. And as you say, Aravinda had a book, but I think it was written in 99, kind of before the back end of his career. Uh, I hope that it's something that's rectified. I would love to work with any of these great cricketers to kind of tell their story. And I think that the world deserves to hear these stories and that, um, I think Sri Lankan cricket demands more attention. Right. In fact, uh, Anura Tenikun, the famous batsman of the 70s, whom I actually saw in a match in Calcutta, he wrote his autobiography two years back and he was persuaded to write. So I think that's a good sign that things are coming out from Sri Lanka. Yeah, absolutely. I think there has been... Um, a bit of a change and you see, you know, Shehan Karuna Tilaka wrote a great novel about Sri Lankan cricket. Uh, Ranjan Melowa wrote a book from a fan's perspective. Uh, I think for a long time, there was a feeling within Sri Lanka that their own history or their own cricket was insignificant and wasn't as, of, as worthy of attention as other nations' cricket. Even in the 60s, you know, I was told that there'd be more stuff on the county championship in sports pages than there was on Sri Lankan cricket. And so I think that, you know, the colonial kind of condescension which came from England sort of seeped its way into Sri Lanka and maybe it took them a while to realize that their own cricket was hugely valid and hugely vital and worthy of respect and admiration and attention. And uh, Kanishka. So I wanted to ask you about the coverage of the Rebel Tour in 81, 82, 82 in South Africa. Now this is, I'm sure this must have been really challenging for you to get people to open up. Uh, I know this is a chapter in their lives that a lot of them want to forget, they don't want to talk about, and a lot of journalists have tried in the past to get them to speak about it, and the, the main response we all get is, why are you raking that up again? So I see that you got Varnapura to open up really well, um, which is fantastic, I really love that part. But I'm sure it must have been challenging for you to get there and get the others to speak about their experiences. Could you talk us through that? Yeah, uh, it was hugely challenging. Uh, no one wanted to talk about it to the extent that um, I met Nimal Hetiarachi, who was a top order batsman who went on that tour very early on in my time in Sri Lanka. He's a lovely guy. We had a great relationship. But when I tried to ask him about it, he just kind of stopped picking up his phone. Uh, and other people cricketers who I spoke to about other parts of their career, guys like Lalith Kalaparuma or Ajit De Silva, kind of 
when the rebel tour came up, uh, they forgot. <laughs> Suddenly they couldn't remember things or they didn't want to, you know. Um, no one wanted to open up about it. Uh, for, I don't know why Bandula was honest with me, uh, but, you know, he was incredibly kind. I met him at Bloomfield, his club, and he insisted on buying me beers and sending me home with chickpea kotu in the most Sri Lankan style. And um, for some reason, he uh, was just willing to speak, and I feel incredibly lucky that he did, uh, incredibly sad that he passed prematurely quite shortly after his interview, uh, but I was hugely, hugely happy that he, I was able to tell that story. Um, very sadly, Tony Opatha, who I think was the real central figure in uh, that whole episode, uh, wasn't willing to talk about, me be to, about it with me because he was working on a book of his own uh, with actually a local monk who was ghostwriting it for him. Uh, and um, very sadly, Tony also passed suddenly uh, quite soon after we spoke. Um, but so I hope that those pages are still out there somewhere and that his story will come to light because it's a fascinating episode, uh, probably rightly something that uh, Sri Lanka wants to forget. I think that those guys maybe, uh, look, I don't know if there's ever any excuse for going to an apartheid country and in endorsing such a horrid regime, even if it's only tacitly through something like sport. But I think a lot of those guys didn't quite understand what they were getting themselves into. Uh, they were in a situation where they were paid a pittance by the board and they saw themselves, you know, they saw a chance to build a life for themselves after cricket. Um, but there's a lot of sadness, you know, not to quite the extent of, you know, what you saw with guys like Danny Germs and Herbert Chang in the West Indies. But, you know, I think Anura Ranasinghe, who was a really talented cricketer who'd been messed around a lot through his career and who probably had the most to lose, kind of um, never recovered from that tour and died very young, uh, having been kind of, you know, I think all these guys were ostracized. Uh, I think Gamni de Sinaika, who was the board president at the time, who a lot of people said, you know, knew that they were going to go, described them as, you know, lepers worming their way surreptitiously. Uh, I think if there'd maybe been a bit more honesty and a bit more conversation, and uh, I think if the cricketers were given, uh, were valued in the way that they felt they should be, maybe nev no one would have felt the need to go and a horrible, unfortunate episode might never have happened. Yeah, I'm probably going to read most of these uh, stories. One of the questions I wanted to ask, I think you brought up about the Tamil cricketers and how things have changed. Another thing that I've heard from the Aussie side, um, I think, I don't know if someone spoke to you about how they phased up to Thompson in uh, 75, I think Vetmuni and I think Mendes. I don't know if it's apocryphal, but Mendes was asked, do you want to press charges against Thompson when he was brought to the hospital? Uh, did, did someone sort of speak to you about facing up to Thompson, that whole story? I've heard it from the Aussie side. Um, Not, maybe Ian Jeppel said or something, uh, I don't know. But. Yeah, absolutely. Like, um, so everyone tells me that Dulip was totally fearless and they said that that bravery was the greatest thing about his batting. And um, I think it was Anurag Tenakun who said to me, Dulip tried to hook, hook Thompson. Not the wisest idea. And um, so I think the first one, it was a fresh air swipe. And then the second one cut back off the pitch and slammed him right in the temple. And everyone who was there describes it as the most horrific sound, like a gunshot. And I think the ball actually hit him so squarely that it went off to the cover boundary. And um, Wetamuni said at the, at the other end, you know, I thought he was dead. Uh, I saw white lips chattering. And there was no stretches at the ground. So I think it was Mevan Pires and uh, one of the other, maybe Dennis Chambagam, had to come on and carry him off the pitch. And then a few balls later, I think some of the Aussies were saying, you know, Jeff, calm down a little. And he was unforgiving. And so he gave Wetamuni a few in the ribs and then one on the big toe, which broke his toe. Uh, and he had to be carried off too. And so, yeah, they got to St. Thomas's Hospital just down the road and a policeman said to him, uh, where were you uh, at the Oval? Uh, what were you doing playing cricket? Who hit you, Thompson? And uh, the policeman just still couldn't join the dots and he said, would you like to press charges? And no, so that story is totally true. Uh, and, um, but you know, I think to Sri Lanka's credit, uh, even in the wake of two of their batsmen being hospitalized, they didn't give up and Anora Tenakon and Michael Tessera carried on batting bravely and I think they made it to something like 277 which remained a 
record score for a side chasing in the World Cup for quite a long time, I think until Sri Lanka broke it themselves in 1987. So um, they stood up and it was, you know, that was their second game in the first World Cup. In their first, they'd been blown out by the West Indies so quickly that they actually organized a fill-up match for fans who'd, Sri Lanka, a Sri Lankan busload of fans who arrived, like, just as the game was finishing. And so they were so embarrassed by their first kind of, you know, introduction to the world and their first um, showing in global cricket. And I think in that game at the Oval, having conceded 320 um, and then, you know, getting close to it, even with two of their batsmen going to hospital, they proved that they could do something and they showed the world that Sri Lankan batting had some tradition um, and had a bit of muscle as well as style. Uh, so, yeah. A 60 over game. Any questions? Any more questions? Yeah. One sec, one sec, the mic. Okay. One of Sri Lanka's most successful batsmen was Marvan Atapattu. And did you get a chance to sort of talk to him? No, we didn't get a chance to talk. Uh, but I mean, I think he was, he's a real unsung hero. Uh, I think, you know, uh, I think, f I mean, well, f what I first should say is he's a kind of uh, a trial to, you know, a real um, symbol of testament because I think in his first six innings... Yeah, he scored double ducks. Five ducks and, <laughs> and a one. And I think the one, everyone who I've spoken to says it was actually a leg by. So, <laughs> uh, so it should have been six ducks. And I think they were spread over kind of six years. I think he made his debut in 91 and through to 90, you know. So he kept getting a chance, getting a duck. And then he came through. And I think from 97 to 2001 or something, he scored a double century every calendar year. And, you know, while Sanath was... Uh, blazing attacks away. Atapatu was there at the other end, kind of, you know, uh, wearing down the new ball and, uh, you know, beautiful technique. He had a lovely cover drive yeah. and I think he's one of the great figures and he's done a lot for Sri Lankan coaching as well. He's also, you know, uh, in the, in management sort of classes, his resilience is a, is a matter of great, uh, you know, example that after scoring so many ducks over three, four years, he went on to score six double centuries. I think that may be one of the largest number of double centuries any Sri Lankan batsman has scored. Only uh, in an Indian management school will you get a resilience lesson like this <laughs> from cricket. <laughs> yeah. um, it was written by, you know, the, the guy who actually promotes this is Harsha Bhogle. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think he's hugely resilient. I mean, even to the extent that uh, when he retired, it was hugely acrimonious because, you know, he was... Uh, the captain, and then he had this uh, terrible back injury. And so Mahela took over as a stand-in captain and did so well that suddenly Atapatu found himself on the sidelines. And I think it was uh, the 2003 World Cup where he you know, couldn't find a place, or the 2007 World Cup maybe, where he couldn't find a place in the side. And then they brought him back for the Australia tour and he scored 100. And he was still you know, really annoyed with the selectors. So he came out at a press conference and he said, um, the selectors are a bunch of Muppets headed by a joker. And uh, so, you know, everyone said, that's the time for you to retire. You can't, talk, you can't talk like that about the selectors. But somehow he's managed to find his way into, you know, positions as batting coach and fielding coach. And he keeps coming back doing um, great work for the team and giving back to Sri Lankan cricket. So I think, yeah, he is a real shining light and an example of kind of uh, fortitude and love of the game. Yeah. Uh, so, like you said, uh, within England and Australia, there was sort of a condescending element towards Sri Lankan cricket. So, within the subcontinent, like from the 50s to the 90s, I wanted to know, like, how did India or Pakistan or like other cricketing nations see Sri Lanka and was there some sort of cricket happening? It's in the book. It's in yeah. yeah, so, um, there lots. was lots. I think there was lots of Asian solidarity, although I think maybe um, India saw Sri Lanka as a slightly little brother. And, you know, for a long time, Sri Lankan cricket was propped up by the Gopalan Trophy, where they would play a game against South India every year, uh, which was, you know, hugely nourishing for Sri Lanka. But when they came here in 1965, uh, probably their first great victory... Uh, at Ahmedabad, I mean, they'd been getting smashed on tour. The first two tests, they got blown out by an innings. You know, the team was falling out. And um, they went to Ahmedabad for this test match, and it was raining, raining, raining. And um, the great Tiger Pataudi, who I'm sure you all know, was something of a cavalier captain. Uh, I think on the third day, you know, the pitch was waterlogged, and he went out with Michael Tessera, the Sri Lankan captain, and he said, there's 20,000 people here, let's play. Uh, 
And he was ill. He won the toss. So he decided that they would bat because uh, he thought that he could get a rest and <laughs> not come in until morning. But that decision maybe changed things around for Sri Lanka. And on the eve of the uh, fifth day, I think it was, um, Michael Tessera decided that they would declare while they were behind. Uh, and they came through on the last morning, ran through India for absolutely nothing and struck this incredible victory out of nowhere. And straight away after that, India... Um, agreed to propose them for associate ICC membership. And that was, you know, a huge springboard. They might have got test status around 1968 if a tour wasn't abandoned uh, because the selectors picked themselves. Uh, but then uh, through the 70s, it should be said that um, Pakistan were also hugely supported and the great A.H. Kadar was uh, probably Sri Lanka's, I mean, biggest, greatest cheerleader um, to the point that I think at one ICC meeting, you know, in those days, England and Australia had their veto powers. And when they vetoed Sri Lanka, he kind of banged his fists on the table and accused them of racism. And I think there was probably something to that, that, you know, they were worried about um, Asia overtaking the game in this kind of east-west balance. And uh, they wanted Denmark or Holland or someone <laughs> to be promoted instead of Sri Lanka. But no, India, um, India and Pakistan were both hugely supportive. Uh, it's ironic because... Uh, off the, off the field, Sri Lanka and Pakistan have a special relationship. On the field, they're constantly bickering. Uh, before the days of neutral umpires, always accusing the others of cheating. Um, and so, yeah, friends beyond the boundary, but as soon as they get inside it, um, constantly squabbling. <laughs> Any more questions? Nick, uh, uh, just, just one second, at the back there, because he hasn't asked a question. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, What's happening to Sri Lanka cricket now? Because, you know, you see an occasional flash once in a while, but you don't see that consistency that you saw in the 80s or even the 90s, or later on, actually, 2000 also. Yeah, I mean, the consistency's gone. Uh, I think a lot of it owes to kind of uh, the administration and a lack of the infrastructural improvements that needed to happen. Someone put it to me as that... Um, the administrators got arrogant and they said, you know, we've won the World Cup in 1996, why do we need to change anything? And uh, it was one of the old cricketers who said to me, that's fine, but you, you, know, you aren't still using a phone that you would use from the 90s. You, know, you don't still have your Nokia 3210, you've got an iPhone. Um, and so I think that there was something of that, that uh, you know, there's been mismanagement. Uh, as money seeped into the game, it's flown out of it through people's back pockets. And um, I think it's fair to say that this crisis could have come sooner but that Sri Lanka was topped up, uh, propped up by incredibly enduring figures. You know, someone like Sangakkara, who was better at 35 than he was at 25. You know, um, someone like Herath, who had, you know, seven test wickets before 30 and then comes in and now has the most for a left arm spinner. Uh, Murali, who was still going at 37. And I think, you know, uh, Vas, who kept going and going. And I think when you get all these guys kind of retire in quick succession, you know, you had... Vas, Herath, Murali, Jawad and Sangakara all go off the back of, you know, Sanath and Marvin going. Uh, when you lose those guys, I think it's difficult to recover. And uh, for a while, cricketers weren't coming through. Now it seems that there's at least a core group of cricketers who uh, can build around. But there needs to be more consistency. I don't understand why that is that someone like Akusal Mendes can look like... Um, the best batsman in the world on his day and then go through a series of ducks. Um, I've been hugely excited about Charith Asalanka, who was great at the World T20 World Cup before last and then hasn't kind of built on that. I think Banuka is another one who he's hot and he's cold. Uh, so I hope that if Sri Lankan batting can find its consistency, I think um, there's a real exciting core group of bowlers to build around. I think um, I have to say that, you know, the IPL's doing wonderful things for Sri Lankan cricket. It's so um, cheering to see uh, a young guy like Amaj Patarana, Junior Malinga, getting games for CSK. And, you know, they've backed Thikshana. Rajasthan Royals have taken on Vijay Kant, Vyaskant, uh, as a net bowler. Um, so the support that Sri Lanka's getting from the IPL is huge. I think that, uh, you know, being exposed to those kind of situations can only do good things for Sri Lankan cricket. Um, they seem to have a habit in the moment at the moment of like every ODI they play of getting bowled out for like between 70 and 150. But I hope that's going to change. And um, as I've said, in Sri Lankan cricket, triumph always comes out of a wave of tragedy. And I hope that 
we'll see at the World Cup them spring a surprise and do a little better than everyone thinks they will because I think the talent is there. It just needs to be built upon. Do you have one more question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, in, in India, clearly it seems like T20 is now the thing. Uh, you know, uh, how is it like in Sri Lanka when you look at tests and one-day internationals and T20s, like, uh, the, the, both at the systemic level and at the popularity level? Uh, I think that definitely um, amongst the fans, uh, T20 is what's carrying the day. And I mean, I think the 50 over game is probably dying and it's um, being swallowed up by T20. But Sri Lankan fans love white ball cricket. That's what gets them going. That's what gets them to the ground. Uh, you know, I mean, going back to the whistle stops, which were one day time games, there's that kind of tradition. And Sri Lanka's always had something of happy go lucky one day cricket about it. Um, I wouldn't say that the younger generation of fans has the same adoration for test cricket. But I think the school's tradition, you know, of two-day and three-day cricket, growing up playing that means that batsmen need to be kind of correct and technically grounded and proper. And so I hope that Sri Lanka will always um, produce the kind of cricketers who can be at home playing test cricket. But look, I think it's a worry everywhere in the world about what the future of test cricket is, where the soul of cricket lies now, what the game's going to look like in uh, 10 to 20 years. And I think it's probably up to us fans as much as it is the players that we have to say that we support test cricket and that it's a great tradition and we don't want to see it die. I mean, for me, Gaul is the most wonderful place to watch cricket in the world. It can't host ODIs because it doesn't have floodlights and so it's relying on test cricket still being played for it to exist. And so I hope it can carry on if just for that beautiful ground, if nothing else. Yeah. So... As he mentioned, T20s are gaining more popularity and like money is coming in a lot more. Do you think that the tradition of school cricket will still be grounded and still be an important part of Sri Lankan cricket? I think so and I hope so. If only... Um because the tradition is so strong. I mean, uh, the Royal Thomian, which is the oldest game in schools cricket, and I think the longest unbroken schoolboy game in the world, goes back to 1878. And um, you see, you know, uh, guys in their 80s who are still talking about a match that they played at school for their school in 19... You no, know, people, yeah, talk about schoolboy cricket that they played, you know, 60 years ago. And I think that... Uh, you know, people in Sri Lanka, I think, get more excited about games for their school than they do about uh, games for the country, <laughs> which is, I mean, just remarkable. But I think there's so much love, so much adoration for it, such a strong tradition that um, I can't see that dying out and I think it'll always survive. And I hope it does because it's um, a wonderful kind of carnival thing. All right, there's one more question, but I think the photograph first and then we'll you can ask them the question once you're done. Thanks so much, Nicholas. Thank you, everybody. But you guys have to see this picture. Hopefully, it'll turn up. Thank you so much, Shara. It's been wonderful. <laughs> you can recognize... Can you recognize the man in the middle? That's what he looks like now. <laughs> Thank you very much. You've been a fantastic audience. So, so Shada, here's my question. Uh, I've been very curious about this. You mentioned the unofficial test with Sri Lanka won over India in the mid-60s. And that's the only test they ever won in India from the 60s. So my question to you is, uh, does it worry the Sri Lankan players that they have never won a test match in India? And this is starting right from 64 till now. So has that ever occurred to them that India is like a last frontier to them? Absolutely. I think they're well aware that um, that's a hoodoo that needs to be broken and that they can't break. I think they thought they were going to do it in 2011 when, you know, Murali was getting towards the end of his career, but still kind of in his pomp. Um, and they had that great generation of batsmen. And then they came and got smashed, I think, in all three tests. Uh, I think probably, I mean, now they struggle to win a test anywhere away from home. So I think this generation isn't as worried about it. But I think it's definitely something that has been at the forefront of Sri Lanka's cricketers' minds. And um, they're well aware of it, definitely. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks very much. And there are books there and you can get... Uh, Nicholas to sign them. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thanks, Thank Nick. you so much. Thank you all for coming.